First, I would like to thank um, Laura for the great job she's done of setting this up and for promotion. I think we should give her and the other people at Synergy a hand for their great work. And um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Julia for his wonderful work. And where's, I don't know if John Zerzan's here, but if he is, well, even if he's not, I'd still like to thank him for his great work. Um, oh, this, by the way, is how I know we're not going to have a revolution. Because if people will pay for water bottled in plastic, they will suffer any indignity. So I'm not really sure what we should do today. I, I had a few ideas. Um, we could either talk about um, the culture of make-believe, or we could sort of go straight to Q&A, or we could talk about the book I'm working on right now, which is a book about how to take down civilization. Yes. I have to tell you, it is so good to be back in the West, because because of the response you just gave. I just did an East Coast tour, New England, and whenever I would say that my new book is about how to take down civilization, they would all look at me and go, hmm. <laughs> so it's so great to be back where people know what the hell's going on. Um, so I was thinking that since we have a choice, you know, since there's multiple things we could do, that, that since we live in a democracy, that we, well, it's actually my best joke of the afternoon, um, we could take a vote. And uh, then I would just go ahead and ignore you and do whatever the hell I want to do anyway. Um, you have to be by consensus. Oh. You know, I'll tell you why there is not going to be an anarchist revolution. Because I was down in Florida a couple years ago doing a talk, and then afterwards, about oh, 10 or 11, that was about 12 or 13 of us anarchists were going to go out to dinner. We stood in the parking lot for 45 minutes trying to come to consensus on who was going to get in which car. And we never did, I actually never did come to consensus. Finally, this one woman said, okay, you three this car, you four this car, you three this car. I'm like, cool, great. So that's how the revolution is going to come, is just this woman has to call it. Um, so that said, um, we did get, I was, I was sort of thinking it might be kind of fun to just go straight to Q&A, but it was a really positive response for the Take Down Civilization stuff. So why don't I just... Yeah, yeah. yeah for which? Yeah. Okay. The people have spoken. Um, can somebody make the lighting less terrible? I'm very dim. I was bright and then I got dim. You know, I was at Syracuse, New York last spring, and um, we couldn't make the AV system work. And I don't think you can say you've lived until you've seen a half dozen anarcho-primitivists try to work an AV system. <laughs> so is this better? Yes. Are, we, are we happy now? OK. So are, we, are you gonna, like, going to stay here on, on call? Or are you gonna... I think I should. <laughs> Anything else anyone needs? Hey, can we do, can we do stereo oh. effects? Okay, so um, what I'm doing with the new book, I'm on about, it's pretty funny because after language, which was pretty big, and then culture, which was really big, um, my former publisher challenged me to write a short book, so I wrote two. And then, um, and then this new book on how to take down civilization, I think I'm on page 500 and... 526, I think. I'm about halfway done. It's, a, it's another big one. Um, OK, so what I'm doing in the new book is I'm going through and I'm stating my premises in boldface. And the reason I'm doing that is because I've heard it said that the first rule of propaganda is if you can slide your premises by people, you've got them. So for example, and I don't want to do that. So for example, if you hear a talking head say, uh, how can we best make the U.S. economy grow? Okay, premise one, we want the U.S. economy to grow. Premise two, we want the U.S. economy to exist. Premise three, who the hell's we? And, and, but they've got you asking different questions. Of, of Hitler, it was said that from insane premise to monstrous conclusion, Hitler was coldly, icily logical. 
And that's really true, once again. Once you accept certain premises, you can uh, go ahead and commit whatever atrocities you want and have them fully rationalized. And once again, I don't want to do that. Okay, so we're going to jump tracks here, which is not going to surprise anybody who's read any of my books. That, and we're going to go a different direction for a second. And I think it's pretty safe to say that the environmental movement is an abysmal failure. And I, almost no matter what measure you go by, um, we're not winning. Um, you know, we don't even slow, not only do we not slow the rate of deforestation, we don't even slow the rate of acceleration of deforestation. And I'm sure you know that 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone. And oh, the head of the National Marine Fisheries Service did give an important response to that. Um, and, and NIMFS, of course, is the organization that is tasked with overseeing the murder of the oceans. And what his response was, was just a direct quote, we have to ask what level of decline is reasonable or sustainable. Um, you know, as a longtime grassroots environmental activist and as a creature living in the thrashing endgame of civilization, I am intimately acquainted with the landscape of loss and have grown accustomed to carrying the daily weight of despair. I've walked clear cuts that wrap around mountains and fall into, ridges, or fall into valleys and climb ridges to fragment watershed after watershed. And I've sat silent near empty streams that two generations ago were lashed into whiteness by uncountable salmon coming home to spawn and die. A few years ago, I began to feel pretty apocalyptic, but I hesitated to use that word, in part because of all those cartoons I've seen of crazy penitents carrying the end as near signs, and in part because of the power of the word itself, apocalypse. I didn't want to use that lightly. And then a friend and fellow activist said to me, so Derek, what's it going to take for you to finally use that word? Will it take the death of runs of salmon so large that horses were afraid to get in the water for fear that, well, because they were afraid, and well, maybe so large that people were afraid to put their boats in the water for fear they'd capsize. So large they'd keep people awake at night with the slapping of their tails against the water. Maybe it'll take the death of flocks of passenger pigeons so large they darken the sky for days at a time. The death of Eskimo, flocks of Eskimo crews just as large. Maybe it'll take the turning of the sea off San Diego into a dead zone. Maybe it'll take docks and in every mother's breast milk. Maybe it'll take global warming. Give me a specific threshold, Derek, a specific point at which you finally use that word. Thanks, George. So I read a really interesting book a few years ago called The Nazi Doctors by Robert J. Lifton. And in this book, he asked the question, how is it that these people who had taken the Hippocratic Oath could go in and participate in a death camp. And he found something very interesting, which is that many of the doctors actually acted in the best interests of the Jews. And they did everything they could to help improve the condition of the Jews, except question the larger framing conditions in which they found themselves. So if a Jew got sick, they might hand him a aspirin to lick or they might put him to bed for a couple days. Or if he had a contagious disease, they might kill him so that he wouldn't give this disease to others. And his point was that they were doing all these wonderful things that they could. Wonderful is kind of ironic. But they were doing the best they could within the Auschwitz re reality. They weren't questioning assembly line mass murder. They weren't questioning working them to death, starving them to death. They weren't questioning the overall cultural racism that led to this. And I think a lot of us as environmentalists end up finding ourselves in similar positions, that we're doing what pathetically little is available to us without questioning the larger superstructure. So that's one of the things I want to do today, is try to sort of blow out that superstructure as much as possible. OK, premise one of the current book is Industrial civilization, we don't have the word industrial, but industrial civilization is not and can never be sustainable. A few years ago, I was riding a car with a friend of mine, George Raffin, and I was just making conversation. I said, so if you could live at any level of technology that you wanted, what would it be? And George can be kind of a curmudgeon, and that day he was in kind of a foul mood and said, you know, Derek, that's a really stupid question. We can fantasize whatever we want, but the only level of technology that's sustainable is the Stone Age. And we will be there again someday. And the only question is what's going to be left of the world when we get there. 
It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that any way of living based on the use of non-renewable resources isn't going to last. In fact, it takes anybody but a rocket scientist to figure that one out. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that any way of living based on the hyper-exploitation of renewable resources, whereby there are fewer salmon who come back every year than the year before, isn't sustainable. In fact, you can also say, and I think this is really true, that any way of life based on the use of resources isn't sustainable because resources don't actually exist. There is no such thing as a resource. What there are is there are salmon whose lives are as valuable to them as ours are to us, and trees whose lives are as valuable to them as ours are to us, and rivers whose lives are as valuable to them. And it's only after they're converted to resources. It's like there's this great line by this Canadian lumberman. When I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And what that means is when he looks at trees, he doesn't see trees. He sees, obviously, dollar bills. He sees resources. And if you see them as resources, you're going to use them up. And this doesn't mean, and we're jumping again, um, no surprise, but this doesn't mean that you can't eat them, you can't kill them. A few years ago, I was doing an interview in Spokane, Washington, and the radio interviewer said, well, you know, Indians ate salmon, too. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. He said, Indians exploited salmon, too. And I said, no, they didn't. They ate them. And he said, what's the difference? And I said, well, they gave them respect for the spirit in exchange for the flesh. And it was kind of bullshit, but I'm a male, so I had to give an answer. And <laughs> that afternoon, I, um, I went out and I sat next to a tree. And I asked the tree, so what is the fundamental predator-prey relationship? And the tree gave me the answer just like that which is, if you consume the flesh of another, you take responsibility for the continuation of the other's community. So if I eat salmon from a particular run, I'm now responsible for that run's continuation. And if a grizzly bear eats, eats salmon, they're now responsible for that continuation. And this is true on a moral level, it's true on a spiritual level, it's true on a physical level, because if you don't do it, the run's not going to continue, as we see. And everybody knows this. Wood ducks know it, tadpoles know it, frogs know it. Grizzly bears know it. Everybody but us. Everybody but a few of us. Um, okay, so, so that's fine, Derek. That civilization is not and can never be sustainable. But what is civilization? You know, I've been bashing civilization for about 10 years, and I figure it's finally time I better define it. And the definition that I've come up with, which I think is really defensible, is civilization is a way of life characterized by the growth of cities. And that's really fine, Derek, but what's a city? So a city I've defined as a collection of people living in numbers large enough to require the importation of resources. And a couple things happen as soon as you require the importation of resources. The first, one, first of them is, which means, by the way, that the Talawa and Yurok who, live, who lived and still live where, where I live weren't civilized. They lived in villages. They lived in camps. And I'm using civilization as pejorative, by the way. And... Um, they didn't require the importation of resources. The Talo and Yurok would eat um, salmon, um, huckleberry, salal, salmon, elk, salmon, crabs, salmon, clams, salmon, 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 salmon. They would also, I don't know if you know this, but they'd also eat salmon. And um, anyway, so a couple things happen as soon as you as soon as you require the importation of resources. One of them is your way of life is not and can never be sustainable. Because if you've denuded the landscape of that particular resource, once again, I don't believe in resources, but it's shorthand here. If you've denuded the landscape of that particular resource, that means that, and you require its importation, as your city grows, you're going to denude an ever larger area of that particular resource, as we see. And the other thing it means is that your way of life must be based on violence. Because if you require the importation of resources, trade will never be sufficiently reliable. Because if the people in the next watershed over aren't going to trade you for this item, you, and if you need it, you're going to take it. And so what this means is that we could all become junior bodhisattvas, and it wouldn't matter. The U.S. would still have a large military, because how the hell else are we going to get access to all the oil that we, we need? Um, so we could all hold hands and sing, give peace a chance, and the military is going to march on.